Well, we're in the book of Genesis, and we're in the 18th session of 24, and we're going to cover chapter 23. We skipped that last time because I wanted to make sure we kept chapter 22 and 24 in juxtaposition to make some points that we did last time. Chapter 23 is really about the death of Sarah, so I just left it for this one. It's a short chapter. Chapter 23, and then 25, 26, and 27. And uh, obviously we're in that portion of the timeline that, uh, you know, after the flood, the call of Abraham and so forth, it's before the monarchy and all of that. So we uh, call it, typically it's the age of the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, down through, and his 12 sons, and through Joseph. And uh, so we've, we've uh, been through what I call Unit 1, the first 11 chapters, which some people call prehistory. Um, the flood of Noah and all of that. But uh, from Genesis 12 on, we have the patriarchs. And we've been through from 12 to 20. We've talked about Abraham. And uh, 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 21 through 27, we had Isaac. And uh, we're going to now go through um, four chapters. The death of Sarah, we'll cover in chapter 23. Then the birth of the twins, Esau and Jacob. And uh, the plot starts to thicken as we get through that. The covenant that we focus so much on in the earlier chapters, chapters 12, 15, and 17. Crucial document, crucial commitment between God and Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. It's crucial for the world because the world is challenging it. Everything you read about in the paper in the Middle East is the world's challenge to God's covenant to Abraham. But it's also important to each of us individually because every blessing you and I enjoy, even as Gentiles, derives from the Abrahamic covenant. We need to understand it. And it's confirmed to his offspring in uh, chapter 26. And then chapter 27, we have this bizarre story where uh, the, the blessing is stolen. And uh, we'll go, go through that. Well, anyway, Genesis 23, the death of Sarah. In chapter 23, verse 1, And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. And these were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, uh, the same is Hebron uh, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And uh, so he, she was his princess. He uh, 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 revealed um, uh, the, in his sorrow the, the depth of soul that had encouraged him through these previous adventures. And uh, he broke forth into weeping and... Uh, the Hebrew words for mourn and weep carry both those ideas. These are very intense. It's just, brief, it's just a brief phrase here in our translation, but the Hebrew carries it. It's interesting that Sarah is the only woman whose age, death, and burial are recorded in the Scripture. I'd make a big thing of that, except it's a point of honor. In that, in that way alone, she's uniquely honored. Um, so we could spend more time on that, but that's pretty straightforward. Let's move on. Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And so he's going to buy a cave, very important cave, Machpelah. And uh, uh, Isaac at this time, by the way, is about 37. I mention that because just last time we talked about him being offered. And many scholars are shocked to really do the math. We always picture him as a little child in being offered on Mount Moriah. And uh, there's a number of us that, have, that infer, we can't prove it, that he probably was in his early 30s. But here he is at 37 when Sarah dies, which is the next chapter. And anyway, we'll go on here. The children of Heth, who owned that land that's around there, Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. Indeed he was, by the way. Remember back in chapter 14, with the Battle of the Nine Kings, that Abraham had under his own uh, organization an army of 318 trained warriors? This isn't just some Bedouin with a few sheep in a tent. He was probably one of the richest men that, uh, in, that, in, in the region. And uh, uh, we need to, need to recognize that. So anyway, uh, and they acknowledge it here. Thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulcher, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. In other words, take what you want. And uh, he, he's not going to do that. He's, uh, he, uh, Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth, and he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me. 
and entreat for me to Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field. For as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for a possession of a burying place amongst you. Don't misunderstand the language here. He's not talking about getting it for free. He's going to purchase it. You need to understand, you know, it sounds to us in our naivete that it sounds like he's, going to, he's offering it free and he'll... So, no, no, he'll offer it for a, for a reasonable price. You know, the, the, you've got Bedouin bargaining going on here, okay? So, uh, and Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham and the audience of the children of Heth, even all that went in at the gate of a city. Notice, this always, all these things always take place at the gate. When you get to Boaz and, and, and Ruth, it's always at the gate. You'll notice that. You need to understand that in those communities, the town, the town council were the guys that sat at the gate. It's, 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 it's the place that the men of authority, in respect of the town, uh, transacted their business. If there was a formal thing to be approved, they would do it at the gate. So when you see, when you hear this, get, get the picture that went at the gate, you're dealing with the alderman or the, count, the city council, if you will. Anyway, he says, nay, hear me, nay, my lord, hear me. The field give I thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people give, give I it thee. Bury thy dead. And Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land, and he spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me. I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. So Abraham recognizes he's not talking for free. He just wants to, he wants to name the price. And Ephraim answered Abraham, saying unto him, My lord, hearken unto me, the land is worth four hundred shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? <laughs> Bury therefore thy dead. You know, such a deal, you know. <laughs> and Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and a Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, four hundred shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. And the, f and the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which is before Mamre, the field, uh, and the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field, that were in all the borders round about, were made sure. And Abraham, for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth, before all that went in at the gate of a city. It's interesting that God has granted them, Abraham and his descendants, the land. Nevertheless, Abraham insists upon purchasing a piece of, it's the only piece of ground he ever earned, he owned on the planet Earth, a place to bury his dead, Machpelah. There's a mosque built there now, but it's a very, very re 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 revered place there in, in Hebron. Um, but uh, it's interesting, as you hear about all these so-called settlements, do you realize that those were purchased from the Arabs at inflated prices over the years? They, they didn't just take them, they bought them. So the, the, that's something the press never brings out. But anyway, let's get back to this. Verse 19, And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, before Mamre, the same is in Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And um, so, it, it, Machpelah means double cave. It's sort of a double cave. And uh, it became the burial place not only of Sarah, but Abraham will be buried there, Isaac will be buried there, his wife Rebekah will be buried there, and both uh, Jacob and Leah will be buried there. Rachel will be buried near Bethlehem. Rachel's tomb near Bethlehem is another very revered place in the Jewish community. But uh, Machpelah is legendary, uh, as you can probably imagine. So uh, that, uh, uh, so anyway, that's, that's Abraham's purchase of this. That, that's essentially chapter 23. Chapter 24 we took last time. That was where Abraham then commissions his business partner, his servant, Eliezer, to get a bride for Isaac. We went through all that last time. Now we get to chapter 25, the birth of Esau and Jacob. Then again, Abraham took a wife. And her name was Keturah. This is wife number three, in a sense. Now, you can argue that one is a concubine, and many people misunderstand that. A concubine is not a whore. A concubine is like a second-level wife. She had certain legal rights, certain status. And uh, so we need, often when you read the Bible, you may miss that. It's a, there's a, there is a distinction. In any case, in this case, we have Keturah. I want you to understand this because, you know, we, we're all familiar with the fact that his, he had a wife by the name of Sarah who had a son, Ishmael, and then Isaac, right? Sarah's died. He's taken Keturah. It's, you want to understand who the descendants of Keturah are. We're going to go through that here. And she bare him, Zimram, Jokshan, 
Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. In turn, uh, Jokshan begot Sheba and Dedan. I'll show you this on a chart here in a minute. And the sons of Dedan were Asherim, Lechuim, and Lubnimim. And the I am ending, by the way, is a plural. In certain Hebrew, not all, but certain Hebrew nouns, the I am is a plural. Okay, in, in English we often just add ness to make it plural. Well, in certain categories of Hebrew nouns, there's an I am ending. And so the Asher in plural would be Asherim, and uh, let, uh, Letshush would be uh, Letshim, and, let and anyway, I, I can mispronounce more of them if you like, but we'll go ahead. <laughs> um, and the sons of Midian, Ephah and Epher, and Hanok, and Abida, and Elda. And all these were the children of Keturah. Now, let's just take a look at this on a chart. It may help you. Uh, Abraham had Sarah, and he had Hagar, right? And he had Keturah. Sarah had Isaac, and uh, through her handmaid at the time, Hagar, she, he had Ishmael. And um, now under Keturah, he has five others. Excuse me, six others. Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. I want you to get, get the broad, you don't have to remember the names, we get the broad picture here. Now, Jokshan had Sheba and Dedan, and uh, under Midian we had Ephah, Epher, Hanak, uh, Abida, and Elda. The reason this is interesting is that Sheba and Dedan are principal cities in Saudi Arabia. From the tribes of Sheba and Dedan come those that are the purest, in a sense, of Saudi Arabians. Okay, But in addition to that, these others under Midian are those that you would call Bedouins. I want you to notice that the, the, the uh, Saudi Arabians and the Bedouins would be most, in, in their purest sense, would be derivative of Keturah. Notice that they're not descendants of Sarah. Okay? They are sons of Abraham in a, in a second level sense. Okay. Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, notice that's plural, there may have been others, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. The concubines is plural, if for no other reason than you talk about Hagar and Keturah. But there's even a suggestion of some scholars, this, mean, this isn't intended to necessarily be exhaustive. Okay, All the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, a hundred, threescore, and fifteen. And Abraham gave up the ghost and uh, breathe, breathed out his breath, is what the Hebrew actually says, or breathed his last, is another way of saying the same thing. He gave up the ghost, and he died in a good old age, an old man, and full of years, and was gathered to his people. That's an interesting expression. It's interesting, if for no other reason, than in Luke 16, Jesus refers... To, the, to, to Lazarus who died, who went to Abraham's bosom. The, the, the whole concept of Sheol, which is the Hebrew term for the abode of the dead. It's not the grave. You can own a grave. You can't own Sheol. Understand there's a major distinction between the grave in a physical sense and Sheol, which is the abode of the departed spirits. Okay? Uh, the equivalent, roughly the equivalent Greek term is Hades. It has a good and a bad region within it. So Sheol had a good place and a bad place inside, if you will. And Hades, when you get to the Greek, the New Testament's in Greek, the word Hades embodies the same thing. Luke 16 is perhaps your primary glimpse into what's going on here. Okay, and I want to derail this discussion to get into all of that, except it's interesting that this expression, Abraham's bosom, is the one the Lord himself uses to describe what I'll call the good part of Sheol, if you will. Okay? And uh, the, you may recall the rich man in, in, in Luke 16. By the way, that's not a parable. Luke 16 is not a parable. It's an actual description. There was a rich man and there was a beggar named Lazarus. In parables, people don't have names. And so the rich man is in torment. He's in Sheol, but he's in a place where he's in torment. He knows that there's Lazarus. Let Lazarus t touch his finger and, 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 and dip my you know, in water and cool my tongue. And it's explained to him that you can't get from one side to the other. It's interesting that they know about each other. He knows that Lazarus is there. He doesn't complain. He knows he's got his just due. But he says, if that's the case, then tell, tell my brothers. So they, they, he recognizes he could have avoided where he is if he had repented. There's a lot there. There looks like a tremendous insight here. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And uh, <clears throat> we generally view that when Jesus at the cross, when he goes to Sheol to preach, to announce his victory, he takes those in Abraham's bosom with him. That's the inference that we draw. And uh, not free of controversy, but that's the general view. And uh, it's interesting that that rich man is still waiting today for that cool touch of water. Uh, heavy stuff. But anyway, moving on. Verse 9. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zahar, and the Hittite, which is before Mamre. In the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried, and Sarah his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well Lahai Roy. That was the well where he first encounters Rebekah, you may recall, the well of he that uh, 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 sees me, and so forth. And that was the place where, the, that was the well that Hagar was rescued by God in a certain sense. So back in chapter 16, you may recall. And uh, so, so uh, that was where Isaac was meditating uh, when he received his, his wife, Rebecca. And uh, uh, so this is a place where God answers prayer. Anyway, now these are the generations of Ishmael. We're switching now. We're going to talk. What the, often in the Bible, the... the, the uh, the secondary ones get brought first and set aside. We're going to talk about get this family tree out of the way before we get into some other stuff. Now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, uh, Sarah's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. It's interesting that it emphasizes their, their, their lineage here. Hagar the Egyptian. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael, by their names according to the generations, the firstborn of Ishmael. There are twelve of them. Uh, Nebajoth, and Kedar, and Abiel, and Mid, uh, Mibsham, and Mishma, and Duma, and Masa, Hadar, uh, Tima, Jatur, Nafish, and Kadima. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their towns and by their castles, twelve princes according to their nations. Remember, God promised Abraham he'd be a father of many nations, not just Israel, many nations. So we went through this before. We had Sarah, Hagar, and Keturah. And under Keturah, we had these six descendants. Under Ishmael, we've got 12 more. So there's 12 tribes, if you will, spawned, if you will, by Ishmael. And uh, so the, thing, the point I want to make, uh, well, we get, we'll come back to this again, but the, uh, we'll come back to this. And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 130 and 7 years. And he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. And they dwelt from Havilah unto Shur, that is, before Egypt, as thou goest towards Assyria. And he died in the presence of all his brethren. All of this is south and east of, of, uh, of uh, the land of Israel. These are the generations of Isaac, Abram's son. Abram begot Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Paddan Aram, uh, and the sister of Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled within her. See, there's more than one. These are the twins. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Interesting, Rebekah's quite a gal. She's quite a spunky gal in a lot of ways, um, as we'll see. But uh, when she's got a question, she goes to the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. <laughs> How'd you like that, girls? Huh? <laughs> two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. In other words, these two people, they're only, not only are there two, but they're very different from one another, as you'll see. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now that's an exception to the normal rule. The firstborn is the one that usually was the priest of the family. The firstborn had a double portion in the inheritance. Firstborn was not just the fact that he was born first. The word firstborn means more than that. The firstborn is like a title. He's the leader. Jesus Christ is called the firstborn of creation in the book, in, in the book of Colossians and Laodicea. Both use that strange expression. It doesn't mean there's more born. It means that it's a, it's a, it's, it's a title of, of eminence, if you will. Anyway, and when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all over like a hairy garment, 
and they called his name Esau. And it's interesting, I won't get into all the play on words here. We're going to find all through this, we're going to miss a lot because there's all through this some real plays on words in the Hebrew. But it turns out the name for Red and the name for Esau are very similar if you accent the syllable slightly differently. So it doesn't sound like, in English it obviously isn't, but in, in uh, uh, Hebrew it was. And after that came his brother out, he came in later so he's younger, and his hand took hold on Esau's, on his heel. Apparently the, the infant actually grabbed a hold of his, his twin brother's heel. And his name was called Jacob, or Yaakov actually. And, uh, and Itzhak was threescore years old when she bare them. And the boys grew. And Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Yaakov was a plain man, dwelling in tents. And Itzhak loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Yaakov, or Jacob. Therein lies the problem, by the way. You've got a divided parents here, and that leads to problems, always does. And uh, so the, uh, it's interesting to really understand, get the picture. Esau is a man of the outdoors. I'll add my own interpretation, a man of the world, if you will. A hunter, very skilled, crafty hunter. He's going to get outcrafted by his younger brother, as you'll see shortly. But um, uh, the other thing, of course, being a, being a man of the, the, the field, he, was, he had a lot of appeal to his father. Isaac liked that, as most guys would, you know. Um, uh, you, you can easily visualize uh, Isaac giving a Harley Davidson for his birthday. I mean, that's the, you know, you get the picture. Um, <laughs> Jacob was a man of the tents. He's an indoor guy. And Rebecca, for probably lots of other reasons too, loved uh, Jacob. So we have this rivalry, one parent favoring one and the other the other. Now Jacob means, or Yaakov, actually means may he protect, that is may God protect him. But the word sounds, agab is, means heal. And agab means deceitful, sly, and insidious. So there's three different Hebrew words here that are... If you pronounce them softly, a little sloppily, they all mean slightly different things. Uh, Yaakov can, is suggestive of a heel catcher. And that's, of course, why they named him that, because that's what he did when he was born. But you're going to discover the name fits for lots of other reasons. Um, and uh, Akab, Akab is heel, and Akab is uh, deceitful, sly, insidious. Um, you know, somebody that you always want to watch over your shoulder kind of guy. So... So that's why the word Jacob, or Yaakov, in your Bible probably has a marginal note, one who grabs the heel, or one who trips up. A heel catcher is often used as a summary label in the English for Yaakov. Now it's interesting, when you get to Paul in the book of Romans, Paul hammers away three chapters in, of his definitive statement of Christian doctrine called the book of Romans. Chapters 9, 10, and 11, he hammers away that God is not finished with, uh, with Israel. It's amazing how... It's too bad more Christians don't recognize that God has got a destiny for Israel that's very paramount. But chapter Romans 9 is on its past. And in Romans 9, starting at verse 11, Paul makes some interesting remarks about all of this. He says, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, namely God. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, and it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. You say, boy, that seems unfair. That was before they were born. Well, that's a little misleading in my mind. Because God knows what's coming. And if you're going to do something despicable, He knows about that in advance. Okay? And uh, now in this case, uh, it gets... Uh, Esau... Uh, God loves the sinner. Don't misunderstand me. But Esau despised his birthright. That's his sin not selling it to Jacob, except to the extent that it manifests the fact they had no regard for it. That's the, that's the problem. Uh, we'll get through this. It's, this is not the only time the normal, uh, that, that the firstborns pass by. Remember Seth and Cain. Seth is younger than Cain, but supersedes him. Shem and Japheth. Remember Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah. Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac was younger, but he came second. But he's the one to whom the promise was given. Jacob is favored over Esau, even though, even though Esau is older. Judah and Joseph were both younger than Reuben, who would have been the firstborn, except he did some things he shouldn't have. We'll deal with that when we get there. 
Moses and Aaron. Aaron was Moses' older brother. And yet, obviously, Moses, Moses got the con here, right? And uh, that's in the Navy sense, okay? Um, and David, of course, succeeds. All his brothers were older than he was, right? So interesting. Now, we look through this family tree. We look through Keturah's descendants, uh, which were the Saudi Arabians and the Bedouins. You look under Ishmael, you have all these other tribes. Now, under Isaac, we have two children, Esau and Jacob. Esau the first, then Jacob. The thing you want to recognize, you'll see that Esau will shortly marry da- uh, daughters, of, uh, or I should say granddaughters, of Ishmael. So you're going to discover that the descendants of Esau and the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Keturah in general are going to intermarry. These tribes will intermarry. They don't keep distinct. There is no command for them to do so. There is no person on the planet Earth today that can trace, I don't believe, they can trace his lineage in an unblemished way back to uh, uh, any one of these because the tribal, over the generations, commingle. You follow me? So I mention that because we often think of the Arabs as Ishmaelites. And you can use that term connotatively, if you will, just as the press uses the term Arabs connotatively. What do you mean by an Arab? Do you mean someone that lives in Saudi Arabia? Are you excluding Syria? You know, and so forth. Uh, You certainly exclude uh, uh, Iran, the Persians. They don't regard themselves as Arabs. But see, our press, what they really mean are Muslims, but they don't want to use that term, so they call them Arabs. But it doesn't mean they're sons of Ishmael or even sons of Esau. Because they could be sons of Keturah outside, sons of Keturah rather than from Hagar. You follow me? That whole amalgam, that whole bucket, if you will, are what's loosely, connotatively called Arabs. Denotatively, an Arab is someone that lives in Saudi Arabia, and, and you, most people don't mean that, where they use the term in a connotative sense. So uh, that, that just will add to the confusion as you read your papers because the press has no concept of what an Arab is, they have no concept of what a Palestinian is. Um, I won't get into that here. Let's go on. Uh, verse 29, Job, Job, he boiled some pottage. And I, again, I'll spare you all the play on words through here, but anyway, uh, he, he, he boiled some pottage. And Esau came from the field and was faint. He apparently, even though he's a very skilled hunter, had a bad day. He didn't get what he had hoped to get. He's famished. Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with some of that red pottage. Now, it's interesting that here is Esau, which means red, and he was red-skinned, red and ha- red, hairy and red-skinned, and yet we have red pottage. There's a lot of play on words in the Hebrew. I'll spare you, but you can see, you can see how it'll play out here. Um, I pray thee with the, some of the red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. See, Esau is his name, but his descendants are called Edomites. The region he settles is called Edom, which means red. It comes from the fact that he was red, but it also links back to this transaction that he indulges with his younger brother. Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. See, I would argue that Jacob is the more clever hunter. Because, and this is sort of interesting because it was prophesied that he would get the birthright, but he indulges it by this this transaction. So, um, now... Esau says, Behold, I am at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do to me? Now, he can be expressing this in terms of his exasperation or his his desire for this, but he's also in the same breath disdaining what good is the birthright anyway. He doesn't regard it. He doesn't take it seriously. It's not important to him. Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he swore to him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Big mistake, Esau. Big mistake has eternal consequences. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of the lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way, and Esau despised his birthright. And uh, there's all kinds of scholastic guessing at what kind of lentils. There were Egyptian beans that, that, that Esau may not have been known about. There's all this, this background that's really tangential to the main issue here. And uh, so Jacob, the secondborn, had the birthright and uh, he was a calculating but very quiet man. He recognized the value of that. And uh, he, he manipulated his brother to giving it up. And uh, so now he probably knew the oracle from back, back there, from uh, 
uh, uh, that um, uh, was announced at his birth. I'm sure Rebecca didn't refrain from mentioning that a lot. So, uh, uh, so Jacob is probably just waiting for his opportunity here. Now Esau is, you know, portrayed as emotional, um, fainting and gasping, famished, and so forth. Uh, gulping is suggested in, uh, in verse uh, uh, one of these uh, verses, and uh, he was more like an animal that had been trapped with bait here. And uh, so, yeah, uh, anyway, let's move on. Genesis 26. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Gerar, a lot happens to Gerar. Gerar is about halfway between Canaan and Egypt. It's, one of, it's, a, it's a border kind of place. And here he comes to Abimelech. Here, this is not the same Abimelech we ran into under Abraham. You need to re- this is one of the reasons we recognize the word Abimelech is probably a title, not a proper name. Okay? And uh, he went unto Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will... Sojourn, by the way, implies that you live there, but you're, you regard yourself as a stranger. You're passing through, so to speak. You and I really should be sojourners on the planet Earth. We live here, but this ain't our home. We're displaced persons. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and I will bless thee, and un, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries. Who is he talking to here? Who is God talking to here? Anyone? Isaac. This sounds familiar because it was said to Abraham. I want you to recognize God is confirming the covenant to Isaac here. I'll be with thee, I'll bless thee. For unto thee and thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And I will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That all echoes familiar because it's, it's a recounting of the commitment that God gave Abraham, now being reconfirmed, to Isaac. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked him of his wife. And he said, She is my sister. That sound familiar? <laughs> Abraham did it a couple of times. Now Isaac picks up on it, right? I have a surprise for you on that. But we're going to get in a little bit to the uh, tablets at Nuzi. And they have discovered that in that region, there was a concept that you could elevate your wife to a position called sisterhood. And so you and I assume, and, and with some validity, that one reason he's doing this is to save his own life. What we fail to appreciate, because we don't, we don't understand the customs that time, that was not unusual to have to designate your wife up a notch to be a sister. It sounds strange to us, and our, we're not familiar with that. There's a number of these things that come out of the Newsy tablets I'll, I'll deal with shortly. Um, anyway, he says, she is my sister, for he feared to say she is my wife, lest, he, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca." Because she was fair to look upon. You know, it's interesting that these guys, these patriarchs, they have good-looking women. <laughs> Sarah was, a, was spectacular, obviously, for lots of reasons. Ask Pharaoh. He noticed that right away. He could take his pick. But Rebecca apparently has the same attraction. She apparently is a pretty sharp-looking gal. The men of the place should kill me for Rebecca because she was fair to look upon. Now, some interesting, par- you probably have noticed already, I want to show you some things. I'm not going to be exhaustive here. I want to highlight some things that you should tune yourself to do in your own notes. Are there some parallels between Isaac and Abraham? Well, there was a famine. They both, they both planned to go to Egypt. Isaac was forbidden to. They stay in Gerar, or Gerar, whatever, calling his wife a sister. That was chapter 12 as well as here in 20. The wife's a beauty in both cases. Abimelech's concern about committing adultery will be expressed. It was expressed back there. It's going to be expressed here. Abimelech's rebuke. Here a pagan leader rebukes our patriarchs both times. Interesting parallels. I want you to be sensitive to parallels because I don't want, you, I don't want to overemphasize this because these are live, real stories of real people that had real passions and concerns and made, did some things right and made some concern, uh, things wrong and so forth. At the same time as you go through, and you st- the more you read your Bible, 
the more you'll discover, and you need to discover it. You can't get this from notes or my telling you. You have to discover it for yourself. But you'll discover again and again and again there's very unusual parallels between the actual narrative and some larger truth, either involving nations or the eternity, a much more global thing. So just be sent tuned to that. And we'll point out a few as you go to, to whet your appetite for that. But let's go on. Verse, uh, chapter 26, verse 8. And it came to pass, when he'd been there a long time, that Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked out at a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. I don't think I need to amplify that. <laughs> right? You get the picture, right? And uh, so there is some play on words here because caressing her is meshek, and it's a play on the word itzak. In the Hebrew, if I could, do, if I could pronounce it properly, you'd see the similarities. There's, there's word play all through this area. And uh, it's also the same word as for mockery. It's used that way. So there's like uh, when uh, Ishmael was mocking Isaac. So anyway, and Abimelech called Itzak and said, Behold, of a surety, he is thy wife. He apparently could tell by the way they were playing around that this was no sister. Behold of her surety, she is thy wife. And how didst thou, how saidst thou, she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, lest I die for her. Abimelech said, What is this thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have lain with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. And by the way, also thwarted the plan of God, incidentally. But let's move on. And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So Abimelech explained it more clearly to his people. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received that same year a hundredfold. Wow. And the Lord blessed him. So the Lord blesses Isaac. And uh, the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father... The Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. So the Philistines had plugged these wells. <laughs> Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we are. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which had, they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerard did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he that called the name of the well is Itzak, because they strove with him. And uh, see, the word Itzak means contention, if you will. And uh, because they strove with him. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And they called the name of it Sitna, hatred. Or, or again, a, a similar word to contention. And he removed from there thence and uh, digged another well, and for that they strove not. And he called it, the name of it, Rehoboth, which means room. We, we, get, we get some openness now. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. So Rehoboth means room or like open spaces. And uh, for now we, the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. And again, Beersheba means well of the covenant, but it also means probably seven wells. It's, there's a pun involved there too. The Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father, fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and will multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there. Oh, that's Isaac. He built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. Uh, 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 and there Isaac's servants digged a well. And Abimelech went out to him from Gerar, and Ahuzah, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. By the way, small point, but Phicol probably also is a title, not a name, because we encounter him later on. Um, uh, or, uh, correction, we, we encountered him earlier in chapter 21, I believe it was. Anyway. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me, and have sent me away uh, from you? And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. That's an interesting observation of their enemy. That's an interesting, interesting observation. We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, Let there be now an oath between us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, 
and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. And he made them a feast, and they did eat and drink. And they rose up betimes in the morning, and sware to one, one to another. And Isaac sent them away, and they parted from him in peace. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged, and said unto him, We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashamoth, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Esau was not supposed to, having a Canaanite, uh, marrying a Canaanite, was uh, uh, forbidden when you get to the Torah. Now the Torah is later, that's under Moses, but my point is he is doing something here, probably deliberately offending his parents. And... Uh, he, uh, he was, it certainly declares how unfit Esau was for God's blessing. Rebellious by the nature. Let's move on. These, these, these daughters, these Canaanite daughters of Esau were a grief of mind into Isaac and Rebekah. They are tying his offspring to Ishmael, in effect. So now we're in chapter 27. We get this famous story of the stolen blessing. It came to pass when Isaac was old. And his eyes were dim, so he could not see. Understand, Isaac is blind, virtually. He called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son, he said, and he said unto him, Behold, here I am. He said, Behold now, I am old, and I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison. Isaac loved the game that, uh, that Esau would bring home. And he apparently was very good at it. He says, And make me some savory meat, such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. So he knows he's down at the final strokes here. And this is sort of a, he wants a special occasion here. Make me some venison, and, I'll, and he'll pass on the, 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 the family blessing. Now Rebekah overhears all this, of course. Rebekah heard when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went out in the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. Rebekah is quite a gal, by the way. She's a spunky gal. So she spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and, bring, and make me savory meat, that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Well, there's a good Jewish mother. She's got it all in control here. I almost hear Naomi and Ruth saying the same thing, coaching Ruth. But this is a little, this is a little more aggressive here. Go now to the flock, and fetch me from thence two good kids of goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loves. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. Jacob said to Rebekah's father, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father, of peradventure, will feel me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me, not a blessing. Smart kid. Mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go fetch me them. This is one of those cases where she's trying to help God. That's always a mistake. God doesn't need our help, you know. God will do it his way. She knew that the, that would, the destiny was for Isaac to have the blessing. I mean, excuse me, for Jacob to have the, Isaac's blessing. And, uh, but she's in here trying to maneuver, manipulate the things that she understands God's going to eventually want, presumably. Anyway, so she's coaching him, and uh, go fetch them. And he went and he fetched and he brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory meat such as his father loved. And Rebecca took a goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. So the mother gets the best clothes of Esau, his own wardrobe. She's not quite through yet. And she put the skins of the kids of goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. And he came unto his father and said, My father, here I am, who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn, and I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? 
Sounds like he's a little suspicious here. And he said, Because the Lord thy God hath brought it to me, brought it before me. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. He's apparently suspicious. Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him, and he said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy as brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? He said, I am. He said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat. He brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said to him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment. It's not like you need some laundry here, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> and uh, blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of the field, which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and the plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, uh -oh, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be every one that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. Well, it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, that Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. <laughs> Here we go. And he also had made savory meat, and brought it unto his father, and said unto his father, Let my father arise, and eat of his son's venison, that, my soul, that thy soul may bless me. As Isaac his father said unto him, who art thou? He said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. Now, <laughs> Isaac trembled very exceedingly. He turned quite violent, apparently, and uh, said, Who? Where is he that, taketh the venison, that hath taken venison and brought it me, and I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him? Yea, and he shall be blessed. Isaac is probably pretty shook at this point because he realizes, obviously, he's been tricked. But he also realizes that what the result is what God had predicted. I'm not implying that God would have had it done this way had they not cheated, but the point is Isaac is shook up for a couple of reasons. Not only has he been hoodwinked by his younger uh, son, but he also realizes that this is God's will. And he would know that because it would, it would bring into focus what was said at his birth. And there's no going back now. And uh, so it's interesting that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20 in the New Testament, it says, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. So it's a very strange way to express this. But Isaac is standing up to the challenge here that the blessing stands that the right of the firstborn devolves on Jacob. Esau is going to be very bitter about it. So bitter that Jacob, under advice of his mom, flees for his life. And it's going to be many, many years before they encounter one another. And when they do, Jacob is terrified that Esau may, uh, Esau may seek his vengeance upon Jacob. And that's the climax yet coming. But when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety, and hath taken away thy blessing. See, you and I think, gee, we don't understand. We think, well, a blessing, you can always bless somebody. I bless you, son. I bless you, too. That's, you know, big no, the, the blessing was a, a sanctioning of the, 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 the rights of the firstborn, which were two primarily being the high priest of the family, and being entitled to a double portion of the inheritance. The firstborn was a, was a, was a, a, a um, status, a, a category, and it, 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 it's not reassignable. Thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? <laughs> For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and, be, and that's a little cheating there because he sold his birthright under deals that they had agreed to. And behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I now do unto thee, my son? 
And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said, And behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and the dew of the heaven from above. And, thy sword shall, and by thy sword shalt thou live and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt have dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah, and she went and called Jacob, her younger son, and said, And behold, thy brother Esau is touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise. Flee thou to Laban, my brother to Aran. It's 450 miles away. That's where they all came from originally. That's where the, the root family was back in, 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 in Haran. And she's going to send her, her, her beloved son away and never see him again, because she will die before he returns. So go, uh, flee thou to Laban, my, uh, my brother, to Haran. Tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away, until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that thou, what thou hast done to him. Then I will send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? So she's had it with her daughters-in-law. She wants to get some of her, want, wants uh, Jacob to find some of their own kind. A couple of summary things. You know, it's interesting as we reflect on all of this. All the participants were at fault. It's easy to you know, it's easy to pin the rose on some particular one. But Isaac attempted to thwart God's plan by blessing Esau. It was God's plan. He announced at their birth that Isaac was to be the favored one. But I mean that uh, Jacob was to be the favored one. But Isaac was really, in effect, trying to thwart God's plan in the first place. Esau broke the oath that he'd made with Jacob. He had, he'd, you know, he'd, he'd passed that birthright on for, 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 for a deal. And Rebekah and Jacob both tried to achieve God's blessing by deception. So there's no high ground here. They've all uh, been wrong. And, of course, their victory would reap hatred and separation. Rebecca would never see Jacob again. And so, and Jacob alone did not destroy the family. Parental preference did. The roots of this are, the, are, are in Isaac's and Rebecca's lap, if you will. Now, there are many lessons here. We could spend a lot of time gleaning all kinds of lessons here. Parental favoritism, of course, which tore the family apart. We've emphasized that already. The spiritual insensitivity of both Isaac as well as Esau. Isaac is, is to blame here in part two. Reliance on the senses rather than spiritual discernment. Isaac loved his venison, right? And Esau brought it, so that made them, they bonded. And of course, the whole issue of deception. Jacob's only hesitancy was the fear that he would be cursed instead of blessed. Fear of being, he wasn't repentant, he was fear, fear of getting caught. He's going to later learn that blessings are given by God, not gained by deceit. That's the lesson that's going to be unfolding as we go forward. Now, as you get into uh, any Bible study, but especially these portions of Genesis, you'll discover there are many levels of understanding. There is the narrative itself, and it's fascinating to get into the archaeology. There are real people, and it really happened. There's are real places, fine. But there's also, you'll discover some spiritual elements. So you can look at this historically, archaeologically, getting into the books and finding out where they've discovered this, that, and the other thing. There's also theological stuff. There's all kinds of doctrinal issues here, where blessings come from and what God's plan is and so forth. And there's also comparative aspects. You can compare this with passages in the New Testament. You'll see all kinds of parallels. I'll show you a few of those before we're through. But perhaps the deepest one, which is different than all the previous three, is devotional. Just immerse into the story and see what God tells you. And recognize that as you go through life, you'll read this story many times as you're going through your Bible. And I'm going to predict, more often than not, when you go through the story, you'll see something you didn't realize before. Some relationship, some nuance, some aspect. And God will use that to communicate with you. So you want to, your first level of devotion would be just to observe what's there. Who did what to whom, when, and where? Think it through. Then you ask the question, why? 
What are the primary implications of what's going on? And then the application, you, you finally want to ask the so what question. Okay, so what? What's the story got to do with me? Now, here. So I'm going to suggest your observation, interpretation, and application is, a, is an approach as you immerse yourself into the Word of God. And so we've, been, we've uh, gone from, uh, through Isaac here. We're obviously now into the whole story of Jacob. So we're going to be dealing with that in the next session. We'll talk about Jacob at Bethel, what happens to them. Strange things happen there. We'll talk about Leah and Rachel and that bizarre symphony that goes on there. And uh, then the sons of Jacob, where the 12 tribes come from. And then finally, Jacob has to flee. His conniving, he's out, he's got a conniving uh, uh, uncle by the name of Laban that we'll talk about. So let's stand for a closing word of prayer, a quick stretch. Father, we thank you for your word. We do pray, Father, that you would speak to us through your word, that you would guide our thoughts, that we too might be more spiritually discerning, that we might too understand that you have your plans, not just for Jacob and Isaac and so on, but for ourselves. We pray, Father, you'd help us discover that plan that you have for each of us, that we might be more responsive to that plan, that we might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities that you've placed before us as we commit ourselves before you in Jesus' name. Amen.